once again thank you everyone for the last sessions in the morning I think many of you are concerned about net zero targets and topics in Taiwan and around the world. We all recognize that this is important to facilitate the be the moderator of this session. Because we have limited time. So we'll start with the topic that we have discussed with the panelists. And if we still have other additional time, then we will reach out to Slidos and the question that you have proposed. And we heard from the Ministry of Economic Affairs, but we haven't heard from Mr. Zhuang from Ministry of Economic Affairs. Maybe we start with him. Hello, I am from Ministry of Economic Affairs. I In April this year, the Ministry of Economic Affairs started our new office uh, that focus on net zero of policy. So I am now the head of the net zero policy and office in Ministry of Economic Affairs. I think that now we can move on through to the first questions. Maybe Mr. Zhuang, you can tell us about uh, After we heard from the CBAM systems in European Union that many companies in Taiwan are very concerned and recently the European Union also have another round of discussions and some preliminary conclusions. So may it be Mr. Drone, you can tell us how the CBAM system in EU or systems in other countries in Japan, in America, etc., how they will impact um, the industries in Taiwan and how governments in Taiwan can help the industries to adapt to this new reality. As the moderator have mentioned before, since the European Council have the CBAM system, they have discuss about different versions and their different modifications. Yesterday, the different organizations in EU have made a preliminary decision. They will focus on um, steel, import energy, um, cement, and certain industries to impose a additional tariff and fees. So they will impose additional fees and include into the new CBAM system. So Ministry of Economic Affairs have been following their development very closely. Beside European Union, several major countries have already um, placed a carbon tariffs and it will create a huge impact to country like Taiwan, for example, because we are a export-oriented economy. So people will ask, how do we respond to C-band system in European unions? And we have proposed a amendment and this amendment is now currently under discussions in the Congress. And in the new amendments, we will start to impose a carbon fee in Taiwan at the border. I think this carbon pricing system will be important to the industries because information transparency will help industries to know how to adapt and how to calculate their own carbon cost. So carbon tariff is an international trend 
and under domestic regulations and requirements, companies also need to take carbon emission into considerations when they are producing their products and service. Different markets around the world have different progresses. EU, of course, is the front runner. Now, America, Japan, Canada, and Australia are also discussing their own、um, carbon tariff systems. Therefore, that we need to know the latest developments and we need to follow their latest announcements in order to. Understand and prepare for the potential impacts to our imports. So, for these countries,、um, some companies or some industries may intend to relocate to other countries because that they want to escape from this very、um, tri- strict.、Um, Carbon regulations. I think that in Taiwan we have、um, comparative、uh, competitiveness to other countries because that our regulations is not as strict as other countries yet. But that's something that we will help our industries adapt to their future export. I think companies and industries are crucial to local economic developments. So while we want to reduce our carbon emissions, we also need to balance with economic developments at the same time. In Taiwan and Korea, there are some similarity in our economic structure. We focus on. Electrical components and semiconductors, for example. So I would like to ask Professor Yun from Korea, from your perspective, during the net zero、uh, transformation process, which industries are the priorities? In the keynote speech this morning,、um, the president. Of Academia Sinica also mentioned that we need technology developments to facilitate net zero developments. So, what are the emerging technologies in Korea that are supporting net zero targets? Yeah. Ah,、uh, thank you for the question. But I'm not sure how、uh, I correctly understand、okay. what's your question. But anyway, in my understanding,、uh, you mentioned you asked about uh, uh, which business or technology has some kind of potential, or、uh, you mentioned、uh, priority you report. But maybe I'm not sure priority. But anyway, <laughs>、uh, I think in case of Korea,、uh, government or domestic. Policy or reduction is important, but it's not the all. I think international market power is、uh, more influential.、Mm-hmm. Uh, like、uh, Taiwan, Korea is export-oriented industry, industrial structure. So you know,、uh, international market press like EU,、mm-hmm. uh, EU's、uh, CBAM carbon border adjust- adjustment mechanisms or、uh, sustainability directive.、Yes. Uh, such Kind of uh, uh, policy approach gives big impact on Korean industry.、Mm-hmm. So, and for example, in case of steel industry, if、uh, EU mobilize、uh, CBAM,、mm-hmm. we should pay extra money、uh, for the、uh, carbon emission cost.、Mm-hmm. So,、uh, in that case, maybe our In the、uh, steel industry, should change their technology without using coccus. Maybe hydrogen、uh, should be used to make steel.、Uh, so such kind of technology is very important. Or I think renewable energy should come first, 
and the energy efficiency improvement technology, gr smart grid operation technology, mm -hmm. they should come first. Mm -hmm. I think renewable energy technology should be combined with uh, digital technology. So in that case, maybe we can reduce our energy consumption and uh, we can expand the share of renewable energy. And through that process, we make new jobs. That is important, I think. Thank you, Professor, for your answers. I think that what Professor have mentioned also respond to what President Liao have mentioned this morning or what uh, Deputy Minister Zeng Wenshen have mentioned this morning. Of course, we want to develop new energy and green energy in order to support our industry development. Therefore, that in the net zero process, we can also create green jobs and better jobs as well. I think this is an important topic that we cover in the session this morning. Now, I would like to ask Alan from French office in Taipei. I think the, the war between Ukraine and Russia is a major topic around the world. We would like to ask Alan that in a geopolitical confrontation like this, it has impacts the world and of course the pandemic have impacted the world for several years. So how will these events influence the net zero policy and net zero process in France? And what are the policy responses from France in order to ensure that you can reach the net zero target by 2050? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, you mentioned COVID and you mentioned uh, the war with Ukraine. Yes. Well, COVID is quite interesting to analyze because, uh, of course, COVID really slowed the economic activity and so it reduced dramatically the carbon emission, especially in 2020 and 21. But in the same time, uh, we've seen that uh, COVID delayed probably uh, the implementation of uh, adjustment or transition economic measures. Um, it's a bit early to assess uh, the performance of our current carbon budget, um, but I think those two effects will balance out each other. Uh, but the next period will be the more interesting to look at. Uh, I mean, after the COVID, the next period, because and I'm not sure that we will manage to reduce after the COVID and uh, voluntarily and all the years the emission as we did during the COVID period. And uh, yet, this is what we should do to reach our uh, carbon neutrality uh, target in 2050. So that shows how uh, ambitious those strategies are and uh, how difficult also they are. With the war in Ukraine, a lot of European countries um, uh, realize how uh, they were dependent, heavily dependent on the Russian gas imports and uh, that push them to look for alternatives and to accelerate the development of their uh, renewable uh, development policy. In the case of France, this is less the case because the f main reason is that uh, the uh, natural gas uh, represents only 16% in our energy mix and uh, the part of uh, Russian gas, even before the war, was very, very low in the case of France, which was, and which was not the case for some other countries 
in Europe. But if I may, I would like to mention a third factor that I think is interesting uh, um, in terms of uh, helping to implement those uh, carbon reduction policy. Uh, I mean, I want to talk about the repeated uh, drought and heat waves that we've been experienced in France in particular this year, because uh, it showed people very concretely uh, the catastrophic effect and of the acceleration of climate change. And so it helped in uh, um, to be aware of the, the stakes and on the necessity to act uh, quickly to, to reach those results. Thank you very much, Ellen. From your response, we understand that at the stage, the Ukrainian war, even though it does not have a very big impact upon the net zero and energy transition in France. However, accelerating the progress is still quite France is focusing on and also an aligned goal for countries around the world. Last but not the least, Dr. Zhuang from ECCT Energy and Environment Committee Chairman, he's a chairman, and I believe um, you've been act interacting with representatives from ECCT and other commerce chambers. So um, Dr. Zhuang, could you elaborate your observation and your understanding that um, as a country is going toward net zero, how do we better communicate with the people and the stakeholders so that we can deliver just transition? Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Liza. Um, citizen participation is certainly a very important role in energy transition. And in Taiwan or in European Union or other neighboring countries, I believe citizen particip uh, participation um, is very important, especially when um, new policies or new adjustments are making unprecedented impact on the life of the people. They have to compromise, and it will be difficult to reconcile. So that's why communication is very important. And I believe um, our representative from the Ministry of Economic Affairs has seen a lot. And from my experiences, when we communicate with the people, I mean the public, of course we have a goal. However, let us not set the time or progress too straight or too strict. Instead, we'll try to put on the people's shoes, try to stand by their side and try to think from their perspective. Well, it sounds easy, but um, sometimes as I work or as I get involved in this communication, there are lots of pressure, pressure from investors, stakeholders, government authorities, sometimes about the license or there are time constraints of application or it might expire sometime. So there are all kinds of pressure and restraints. However, Energy construction is part of our basic infrastructure. So once it's there, it's for a lifetime or generations. It's irreversible. It's a permanent change to their lives. Whether it's green energy or it's new energy technology, the communication process must be toward the right place. If not, I mean, without a solid communication, in the future, we will still see negative impacts. So we cannot be too hurry. We have to make sure communication is ready. I think that is a really a clear message. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. To reach social consensus that is essential, that is inevitable in delivering net zero. So first of all, to reach social consensus, we need to communicate relentlessly with all stakeholders and we need to have compassion that we can put on other people's shoes. Okay, we have last five minutes, the last five minutes and I'm seeing two questions on Slido. Actually, um, we have one question to Professor Yun um, from Korea and also another question 
for Alan. So、um, let me read through the questions. So the first question for Professor Yun. Korea transition process so far. Ah,、uh, yeah. Thank you for ex. Think general public citizens. I always argue all keys are given to hands of citizens. Why? Election changes everything. You know, I already presented our energy policy and maybe、uh, carbon neutrality scenarios, especially concerning、uh, sectoral target, can be changed because of the election result.、Uh, I think NGOs and the business sector sector also important, but they need support from the citizens. Otherwise, their argument. Can lose the power, so all citizens should express their will through elections. And after election, they can give pressure on the politicians. Why don't you move toward the carbon neutral society? You should make some laws and act, and otherwise we cannot survive. So I think you should have the you have the key. You are the main character of this change. I that is my emphasis. Thank you. Thank you for your very passionate answer. I think that general public and citizens are the stakeholders that we need to pay attention to. The next question is referred to Ellen. Oh, why France would like to reduce the ration of nuclear consumption in 2050? So please, Ellen. May I remind? This is a bit sensitive in Taiwan. It's a sensitive、uh, topic too in France. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for this question because this is、uh, the the main、um, uncertainty that we have in our scenario.、Uh, as I said, we have a large fleet of nuclear reactors in France, fifty six that were built. For most of them, 40 years ago, which means they will be expiring, expi expiring、uh, within the next 10 years for half of them. And so,、uh, nuclear always, has always been, like everywhere,、uh, very sensitive、uh, topic in France too. And so, the question is now:、uh, what will, what should we do about those、uh, nuclear reactors that will be expire in the coming years? Should We try to extend their life. Okay, that's why this is the, the main option that we are taking now. Should we replace them by、uh, renewable energy, or just to replace the part of them? So it's really, and as Professor Yun said,、uh, it's a very political topic, which means that at every elections. It's on the table again, and、uh, the, the the action you take、uh, have to take the result of those election into、uh, into account, and、uh, this is moving. So、uh, I cannot say more than that.、Uh, the 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 decision has not been、uh, completely taken about、uh, what we'll do on the nuclear,、uh, but we'll go on with nuclear. But we don't know the. Precisely, which part of nuclear compared to which part of、uh, renewable energy? Thank you, Alan, for your answers. I think that we have used up all the time we have. Last but not the least, I want to make a conclusion here that the deputy minister have mentioned before. In order to achieve the net zero targets, we need regulations. We need financial sector. We need public consensus. I have been supporting companies for many years. I think that、um, company and corporate actions are very important. All these forces combined together、uh, are. Criticals for us to make sure that we will have a human-centered just transition. We hope that after the events, that 
we can have a just transitions. I think we need to be inclusive in the transition process. We need to be inclusive, and no one should be left behind in the process. Besides inclusion, we also need to integrate. We need to collaborate and work together in order to achieve these targets. With all these efforts, I believe that we can prosper and benefit together in this journey toward net zero. And we need to be inclusive. We need to、um, collaborate, and also need to prosper together. This concludes our session today. Thank you for everyone for your participation this morning, and please thank our partner panelists with a round of applause for their participation. Thank you.